Okay, moving right along with our object-oriented programming introduction. This is part two. We're going to do a little bit of review and talk about attributes and recursion. Very interesting stuff. First, let's review. Since terminology is here to stay and you can't do this, you can't read books or you can't participate in this world without knowing the right terminology, we're going to review some of the items from part one. First of all, there's classes. These things define objects. So in the example of the dog, Canis lupus is the class, and the actual domesticated dog would be an object. Instances are individuals created from those definitions. So in my case, Tramp is a dog. She is an instance of the class. She is not the class. So let's make sure we understand the difference between instances and objects. Next is inheritance. Inheritance classes inherit all of the traits of the less defined or more vague or classes. So dogs, for example, inherit from carnivores, mammals, and vertebrates. Cats, which are very similar, would also inherit from carnivores, mammals, and vertebrates, but they do not inherit the unique tooth structure of canines, which is where they branch off to a different family, genus, and species. Motorcycles inherit from motorized two wheels vehicles, just like scooters do, but race motorcycles inherit from motorcycles, they don't inherit from scooters. I mean, I don't know, maybe there's such a thing as a race scooter, um, but in either case, those are that's where the branch uh, splits, that's where they break off. So that's inheritance. Then we talked about constructors. Now, constructors, all individuals go through some kind of construction process. The factory constructors are out of our control, it's part of the language. You, myself, and Tramp, we all spent time in our mother's womb. That is outside of our control. However, construction processes can be augmented. You can add stuff to it. So for example, we can perform a just born process to any object that we define. Maybe we want to initialize some parameters. Maybe we want to uh, blank the screen. Um, <clears throat> make sure that the sensor is working. Any kind of thing like that. For example, when Tramp was born, she was cleaned with a towel. So that is an augmentation of the construction process. Okay, then we talked about encapsulation. Big word, but essentially each class encapsulates its items as its own. A dog's stomach is different than a cow's stomach. But if we could speak with them, they would each say, my stomach. In Python, we don't say my stomach, we say self.stomach. Other languages use very similar syntax. Usually a period is what separates the different parts of, of an object, okay? So, additionally, each individual encapsulates its own items. If we had two cows, and we asked each cow how full their stomach was. Maybe one cow says it's full and the other cow says it's at half, half full. So in each case, that cow's brain would be running a procedure similar to self.getStomachLevel and each cow would get a different result. That is, of course, assuming that cow's brains run on Python. So, question, what are the pros and cons of all of this stuff? Well, it surely seems like a whole lot of organization. And uh, you can think of organization as sort of the foundation. If you have a house, if you're building a house, and you have a really lousy foundation, chances are that no matter how well the house is meant to be, it's just not going to work out very well. You need a very good foundation. If 
the foundation doesn't have the pipe for the drain of the toilet, well, you can't very well put a toilet there. So that's why we do all of this organizational stuff. But I listed here some of the reasons that are good about object-oriented programming. It's much easier to read, write, and develop software. It's very, very simple to reuse code. There's a worldwide community website, the Python Package Index, where you can download literally thousands of different packages written by people all over the world. It's very easy to divide a big job into small chunks, say you're working with a team. It's very easy to debug, since methods are usually very, very short, just a few lines, and it's considered bad practice for a method to be longer than a screen. There's no real speed penalty. Theoretically, you could write a program that is just one big, long, giant text, but it would only be a few nanoseconds faster than, uh, than something that's done with classes and organized. It's the reason why essentially all of these um, languages are going to this method of object-oriented programming. Of course, if you wrote your program like that in one giant long stream, it would be incredibly difficult to debug and it would be incredibly difficult to reuse any part of it. Um, Python in particular is very easy to test because it's interpreted and not compiled and I don't want to get into what that actually means. It's platform independent. You can run it on Windows, Linux, Apple, Android, and on platforms that don't even exist yet. It's very easy to program as a team, as we said uh, earlier, and you can incorporate modules written in other languages. So let's say you want to interface with that sensor that takes 2,000 measurements a second. Each measurement has eight parameters. You can only do that with assembly language or something similar. You certainly couldn't do it with an object-oriented language at least not yet. Okay, so that's the good things. So what are the bad things? The bad things is that object-oriented programming requires a whole heck of a lot more hardware, more RAM, more hard disk, bigger chips, faster chips, etc., etc. It runs slower than non-object-oriented languages. Python, in particular, is not suitable for anything that requires billions of calculations. For that, there are other languages that are more suited. However, they're all very, very, very difficult to uh, learn, to program in, and such and so on and so on. There are, like I said, OOP languages suitable for that kind of stuff, like C++, C Sharp, Lisp, Perl, and so on and so on. And Python in particular, and really most object-oriented programming languages, cannot run on teeny tiny little processors that you find in the Internet of Things. Things that are, you know, acceleration detectors that are the size of a penny or entire computers that are the size of a quarter. So those are the bad things about object-oriented programming. Um, however, the bad things are so, so slight compared to the good things that object-oriented programming is the way to go. And uh, there are very, very few instances where you have to go to a different type of programming language. I want to give you a little Python side note. Python was actually developed, invented by one guy. It's his brainchild. He started it as a hobby while he was working in some uh, company in the Netherlands. He uh, calls himself, or did, the benevolent dictator for life. Um, but in 2018, he resigned. He said he wanted a permanent vacation. He named the language after Monty Python, and the official documentation often quotes Monty Python. Really, really funny. Python is now used worldwide, and its core philosophies are sort of interesting. Beautiful is better than ugly. Explicit is better than implicit. Simple is better than complex. 
complex is better than complicated, and readability counts. Um, in fact, in the community, you talk about doing Pythonic things. Um, it's considered very important that your code is easy to read. Why? Because at some point, you are going to have to read code that you wrote years ago, and you want to make it easy for yourself. If you're going to share it, obviously, you want to make it easy for the next person. Okay, take a breath. Let's talk about members. Now, members are also called attributes. Now, let's remember that each box in the class tree, like in our biology tree, has particular traits that define those members. For example, every mammal produces milk. Every mammal has teats. In fact, that's where the word mama comes from <clears throat> because the young are nursed by the mother and the mother produces milk. That is a particular trait that defines every member that is a mammal. These traits are inherited by all of the subclasses. So, for example, dogs, cats, cows, humans, horses, all inherit from that definition of mammal. And every one of those animals nurses its young with milk provided by the mother with her teats. In object-oriented programming, there are three types of attributes. Now, during the course of the program, in other words, while it's running, there are constants. These are things that do not change value. Things like, for example, the value of pi or the value of e or the square root of minus one or the gravitational constant at sea level, things like that. Variables are things that do change value, things like the speed of my motorcycle or how full my stomach is, um, stuff like that. Then there are methods. Methods, and this is very important, you call it a method, not a subroutine, because subroutines do not exist in object-oriented programming. <clears throat> methods perform some action, like calculating the area of a circle if I give you a radius. But you have to give me the radius. That is called the parameter. Parameters is the name that we use for, say, what you would call an input to the method. Methods often produce outputs, and those things are always called return values. So those are some more new words. Constants and variables, methods, parameters, and return values. Now let's talk about constants. Like in algebra, you usually write it in a form like pi equals 3.14, whatever, whatever. Or title equals in search of the holy grail. And you have to put that in quotations in order to indicate that it's a string. It is simply easier to type pi than to type a whole bunch of numbers. So that's why we use them. Constants can be numerical, they can be characters, they could be strings, they could be a set. For example, the gravitational constant G. Sure, it's 9.80665, but 9.80665 what? Well, it's kilograms, meters per second squared. And a constant could be any other type of the language understands. Typically, in Python, we write constants in uppercase, so that we know it's a constant. Uppercase, typically separated by underscores, okay? Variables. Again, like in algebra, you usually write a variable like this, radius equals 5, or theta equals 30, or something like that. Variables do change during the course of the program. So while my program is running, for example, velocity could change. Um, the temperature that I'm sensing could change. Acceleration, um, something that the user inputs, all of that stuff can change. That makes it a variable. 
usually variables are stored in RAM. I say usually because it depends on the hardware and the language and such and such. In Python, it's stored in RAM. The current value of that variable will disappear if the power goes out or the program is terminated for whatever reason. Variables can be any type that the language understands. Now, you're thinking numbers and text, but there's other things. They could be operating system specific. They could be pointers to other variables. So instead of actually holding the house, it just holds an address to the house. That's a pointer. It is not important to know all of the variable types because you never can learn them all since they're being invented at all times. And every time a package is contributed to the worldwide community, another type was just invented. Variable names typically start with lower case. Again, this is a Pythonic thing so that we know if we're looking at a variable or we're looking at a constant. The next thing, of course, are methods, number three. Those are the, that's the third type of attribute that you can do for a, um, an object. So an object can have a method. A method performs something. It often takes some set of values as inputs, those are parameters. It produces an output, that's a return value. Methods can be as short as one line of code, but they should never be any longer than one screenful. It should be something very, very simple and specific. That way it's very easy to debug. Here's an example of a method. An example of a method that uses Python syntax. So just ignore the formatting marks, but this basically says factorial of n. If n is less than or equal to 1, return the number 1. Else, return n times factorial of n minus 1. What? So you're saying this is a method that calls itself? Yeah. You could think of factorial as 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is a simple way that it's defined. Or you can think of it as 4 times 3 factorial. Of course, 3 factorial is equal to 3 times 2 factorial, and so on and so on. Let's have a thought example of recursion. Suppose that there was a big, big line at the Costco checkout. If people were computers, or if they acted like computers, and the person behind you asked you how long the line was, you could walk to the front and count them all, or you could ask the person in front of you, hey, how long is the line? You wait for the answer, and then you just add one, and you tell the guy behind you. The person in front of you, of course, would have the same program, so he would ask the person in front of him, hey, how long is the line? And so on and so forth. Eventually, the person at the front would simply answer one, because he doesn't require any input from any other person, and he would tell the guy behind him, one. And then it would all ripple backwards. Each time a new instance would add one. And by the time it gets back to you, you know exactly how long the line was. Now that sounds ridiculous as human beings, but for computers, it's a very efficient way to do things. The factorial example and the Q example, those are examples of recursion. Every object-oriented language is capable of recursion. They're very, very quick, and they're very simple to debug. A recursive method will do something and then call another instance of itself with a new parameter. So it's as if a dog asked another dog to bark in order to pass the message along, just like in the movie 1001 Dalmatians. When a certain parameter is reached, the loop ends. And each instance is essentially a new individual, a lot like those nesting dolls. So each instance has its own variables, and each instance has its own scratch pad. Think about that. And then think about this. There's an old programming joke about shampoo bottles. A lot of them say, lather, rinse, repeat. Well, that's an example of an endless loop. If humans were like computers, you would stay in the shower forever, 
as long as shampoo is available because you would lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, and so on and so forth. Nothing tells a user to stop. All recursive functions need something to tell it to stop. Otherwise, it would go on forever. And that is called an endless loop, and we don't like those things. That is the end of part two. I hope you enjoyed it. Part three will be coming along soon.